welcome to Lecture 4 on Study Design. The last two lectures have devoted, been devoted to issues that come up in studies and questions about how you create a sample, all of which are deeply related to what we're talking about today, which is the procedure for designing a study. So I'm going to start by reviewing a couple of terms from the previous two lectures. Remember that a lurking variable is a variable which affects the explanatory variable and is associated with response variable. Usually it affects the response variable. And the point of a lurking variable is that it can create an association between two variables even though there's no causal association. It can also hide a causal association by creating the opposite association that masks it. Lurking variables are a pernicious problem when we're looking at the relationship between two variables, and the only long-term solution is an experiment. An experiment is a study in which the experimenter assigns values of the explanatory var variable randomly to the subjects. Um, and anything that's not an experiment is an observational study. Notice, because the experimenter is randomly setting the value of the explanatory variable, no other variables can affect it. That's why it eliminates lurking variables. We also talked about sampling procedures. Remember, a sampling procedure is a process for choosing a sample. It needs to be repeatable and not haphazard. It means I need to know how to do it multiple times, what it would mean to repeat that, and I need to be able to figure out what the chance of each individual of showing up in that sample is. The best kind of sampling procedure is a random sample, which is really a random sampling procedure, which is one in which each individual in the population has an equal chance to be chosen. So in that sense, it's fair. We talked about several different kinds of random samples. The one we will most commonly deal with in this class is a simple random sample, or SRS. It has kind of a technical definition. It's one in which each combination of individuals of the same size has an equal chance of being chosen together, but you can think of it more mechanically as it always comes down to listing everything in the population, signing them numbers, and then picking numbers randomly using a random number table or a random number generator. Simple random sample is not better than other kinds of random samples. Uh, it is easier to work with and so it's what we will focus on in this class. A little extra math is required to do other kinds of random sample. But if it's not a random sample, you have the possibility of introducing sampling bias. Sampling bias is when a group of individuals more or less likely to be chosen by your sampling procedure differ in one, some way on some parameter from the general population or from those not in the group. One common source of sampling bias is non-response. Non-response is the failure to get data from some individuals that you attempt to include in your sample. Significant non-response creates the possibility if the people who do respond and those who don't differ in some way, that's the possibility of bias. So I want to give you the five steps in study design. This is stuff we're going to talk about all semester long, so you will need to know it. I'm going to illustrate the five steps with an example. The first step is formulating your initial question. It is what you're interested in finding out informally. So in our case, let's take as our example, we're interested in knowing whether prayer works. You can see it can be, to begin with, a relatively vague and broad question. Uh, but your second step is to turn that into a precise question. What does that mean? We want to turn it into a statement or a question about parameters. And parameters mean summaries of a variable in a population. So the first step is to turn that broad, vague question into a population, one or more variables, and some statement about one or more parameters. So in our case, prayer works is too vague. What might you want prayer to do? Well, one thing people do with prayer is they pray for sick people. What are they hoping? They're hoping that the prayer will help the sick person get better. So that's a more concrete question. Do people who get 
do sick people who get prayed for get better faster than sick people who don't? So our population needs to be some version of sick people. We're going to make that a little more precise. Sick people is kind of hard to gather data about. So we're going to look at our population is patients who just had heart surgery. Why? They're easy to get information about because after you have heart surgery, you're in a hospital for a while and everything about you is recorded. And uh, because heart surgery is complex, some people recover very quickly and some people have all sorts of post-operative infections and complications and take longer to recover. So the length of recovery is a good stand-in for how well they get better. Right, so what are our variables? One straightforward, whether or not you're being prayed for. That's going to be our explanatory variable. Uh, the other one, there's lots of ways we could measure how much they get better, but I'm suggesting that the time until they're released is a good one. Easy to measure and straightforward. <clears throat> then what would the parameter be? Well, now we're going to look at the average time till release of those who got prayed for and those who didn't get prayed for. And if the ones who got prayed for, on average, get released sooner, that's going to suggest that prayer works. Okay, notice, very important point, is there was a big gap from our initial question to the question we turned it into. The process of making an initial question precise can change it, and it might be one could reasonably look at that and say, that has, I believe in prayer, but that has nothing to do with what I believe prayer does. And you could argue that this has totally missed the point of the question. You can think of that as a kind of bias. It's not usually described as bias in statistics, but it's a similar idea. It is um, a problem that can potentially shift the answer in a direction from what, in some sense, is the truth. So an important point you need to be aware of is how well does the actual precise question they addressed model the initial question we were really interested in. Another thing that you will never get answered by a... Um, uh, that you will never answer by a calculation or an Excel spreadsheet. You will have to do that on your own. Okay, the next step we are familiar with and that is the sampling design. I'm sorry. Our sampling procedure. Uh, so what are we going to do? We need to do something realistic among all heart patients. We're going to randomly select from among, say, 200 people, from among the patients who receive heart surgery at Yale New Haven Hospital during May. Notice, although we're randomly selecting from that group of patients, we could easily do a simple random sample of those patients. It is still not a random sample. Why? Because we only sampled from one hospital one month. Our population is all patients from post-heart surgery. Uh, so it's not random, and there's the potential for bias. What would bias be? We would have to argue that there is some way in which patients at Yale New Haven or patients in the month of May recover faster or slower than other patients, or get prayed for more or less. Maybe that you can't make such an argument, in which case it's not random, but can be treated as such. We will often be in that situation. The next step is what's called the measurement process, that is, the process of gathering data about your sample. Once you've picked your sample, you have to write down the values of each of the variables. That's all the measurement process is. It sounds very simple, but it can often be complicated. In our case, one of the variables, writing down the value is very straightforward. We picked our 200 patients. We asked the hospital, how long were they in recovery? Boom, you're done. But the other one is more complicated. Um, first of all, how do you decide whether or not someone has been prayed for? How do you know? And how do you measure it? But more importantly, here's the point where we need to worry about lurking variables. And the lurking variables are a substantial problem here. Why? Because what kind of people, what would correlate with being prayed for? What kind of variables might affect whether or not you're prayed for? Seems to me that being an active member of a church, being part, having a lot of friends, having family who are still alive and to which you're close, 
How might all those things affect your recovery? Well, all of those things mean that you have probably a well-connected, happy, emotionally full life. You have a lot of reasons to live. You have a lot of emotional support. All of those things, plausibly, could make you get better faster. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> what's more, we have a placebo effect going on here. Even if, even if I ask somebody to come in, like I could you know, hire a priest to come in and pray for half the people, uh, that would solve the lurking variables if I randomly assign them, but I would still have a placebo effect. Right? People who are getting prayed for, if they believe the prayer works, they're going to believe just like they believe the doctor with the sugar pill. They're going to believe in the effect, and that may help them get better. So what's the solution? I should tell you at this point that I'm basing this example on a study that I actually saw, um, although I changed it somewhat. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to divide the 200 patients into two groups of 100 randomly, so it's going to be an experiment, and to make it double blind, we're going to give the names of the 100 people we're going to be prayed for to a church group somewhere far away. Back in the study, they went to Korea. And they found church groups in Korea, and they said, here's some names, pray for these people. Okay? Mm -hmm. They're getting prayed for. They have no idea whether they're getting prayed for or not. It has no correlation with any other aspect of them, because it was randomly assigned. Finally, the last step, once you've got your data, you know what your question is, you need to do the actual quantitative analysis and draw conclusions. In some sense, this is what we're going to spend most of the rest of the course on, but in some sense, this is the most straightforward part. In this case, it's quite straightforward. We're going to look at the average time till release of the people who got prayed for, and the average time to release of people who didn't get prayed for. And if the first is a lot smaller than the second, we can say, okay, people get prayed for, uh, get better faster. Prayer works. There's really only one complicated aspect there, which is you have to distinguish random variation in how people get better from variation that's because of the underlying effect. We will learn how to do that, a very good job of that, later in the semester. That's inferential statistics. But lying behind all of that will be this the first four steps. They all introduce problems in their own way. We talked about, for example, the sampling bias. We talked a little bit about the problems introduced by two. All semester long, we'll see the problems introduced in five. I want to talk about now the bias introduced in step four by the measurement process. That's called measurement bias. It's a bias. So once again, it's a direction of a parameter and something is a problem which shifts the value that you think is true from the actual value that's true. In this case, it's going to be something about how you record the information about each individual, how you gather that data about the individual. So specifically, it's a direction of a parameter in which if you recorded data for the entire population, the recorded result would differ from the truth. So it's not got to do with the sampling process in particular. What does that involve? Well, let's say you were measuring people's weights. You know, on this, your scale, there's a little dial. If you look at it when nobody's standing on it and the, um, and the thing doesn't read zero, you push that dial around until it reads zero. If you don't do that, if your scale, when nobody's standing on it, reads negative one pounds, then it's generally going to underestimate everybody's weight by pound. If you record everybody in your study, if you record their weight on that, they're all going to be, on average, one pound underestimate. That is a measurement bias. The process of measuring introduces a bias. You can see this is a big and complicated issue in the hard sciences, where quantitative measurement is a big deal. I have one example I want to go into detail, just because it's a wonderful example, um, which is measuring iron in the ocean. turned out, in the 80s, a big question people didn't understand was why there was much less plankton in the oceans than their understanding of the science so told them there should be, at least in some areas of the oceans. And along came John Martin, who had a background in measuring trace metals in solutions. And he said, probably the problem is that there's way less iron in the ocean than you guys think. 
Why? Because plankton need iron. So if there's very little iron, that could be the thing that limits what the plankton um, do. Uh, why would why might they not have the right estimate for the amount of iron? Think about how you'd measure the iron in seawater. Uh, I don't know how you'd measure it. I don't know what the actual process is, but I know how you'd start. Right? You'd get in a boat, you'd go out to the ocean, you'd stick a pitcher in the water, you'd get a pitcher full of seawater, head back, stick it in some machine that, I don't know, maybe there's a magnet that tracks the iron or light shines through it and you look how the light is bent by the iron, I don't know. But that in that procedure, you go out in your boat. Well, it's a boat, well, it probably has a steel hull, which means that the seawater next to that boat it's going to pick up a tiny bit of the iron from that steel. When you dip your pitcher in, it's going to have a little bit of that iron from your boat. How about your pitcher? Probably not made of steel. Probably made of glass or plastic. But it was made by a machine. It was cut and ground and shaped and heated by a machine that was probably made of steel. So it absorbed a little bit of that iron in the steel. And the seawater, when you stick it in there, absorbs a little bit of that iron. The machine, all the things you do to measure the uh, iron content are either stick the seawater in something made of steel or in something that was made by something made of steel. Right? Everything in our human-made universe is polluted, in this point of view, by the presence of iron. Because it's everywhere. So, unless you're incredibly careful, your measurement process is going to be uh, polluted by trace amounts of iron. That may sound like a tiny amount of iron, but in fact, the only amount of iron that's in seawater is tiny already. So the amount there is enough to throw things off. So John Martin went through what I gather was like a several year process of finding a way to measure the seawater with no contamination from iron. And he found that it, the actual amount of iron in the sea was vastly less than people thought it was, just because they were measuring badly. Uh, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because plankton inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. They're plants. So if there were more oxygen, more iron in the water, there would be a lot more plankton, and that plankton would be sucking in carbon dioxide and turning it into oxygen. It would be sequestering the carbon in the atmosphere, which means it would be reducing some of the carbon dioxide that we humans are putting into the atmosphere, and therefore, presumably, reducing the global warming caused by that carbon dioxide. John Martin, in fact, proposed we seed the oceans with iron as a solution to global warming. Small experiments have suggested that this might work in practice. There are all sorts of technical issues, but it's a question on the table. So measuring bias can be very complicated in the hard sciences for what we do in this class, um, it will tend most of our measurement. In the examples we talk about when you do your group projects will be much simpler than that. Often it will be by surveys. It will be asking people questions. Um, and when it comes to asking people questions, measurement bias is much simpler. And there are really only two possible sources, but they're quite common. The first source is called response bias, yes. I apologize that that sounds so much like non-response bias, which is totally different. Uh, response bias is a psychological effect whereby people's answers to questions are swayed by what they want to believe is true or wish were true or what they think the questioner wants to hear. Uh, <clears throat> this is particularly true questions that involve kind of a, a judgment or an estimation. So. What's an example? My favorite example. In the 90s, there was a guy, I forget his name, an anthropologist who studied people in everyday life by looking at their garbage. All sorts of interesting things that he found out. But one thing, he went to people's doors, knocked on the door, and asked them, how much do you drink per alcohol? And then he went around back, and he looked at their trash. And he looked at how many empties they threw out, and used that as a pretty good proxy for how much they drink. You can see there's some issues with that, but he worked that out. Uh, and he concluded that almost everyone underestimates how much they drink. It was a universal effect, from teetotalers who drank a drink a month 
to people who went on benders five days a week. Always underestimated by about the same amount. It was like sort of half or two-thirds of what they actually drank. Really important point. Mostly, this was not people lying. It's not people who knew they drank seven drinks a week and said five. It's people just kind of misremembering, coloring, leaving out things that don't seem like they really count, or viewing frequent things that happen every once in a while. Another uh, example of this, or potential example of this, in the 80s and 90s, this seems to have stopped being true, but in the 80s and 90s, there was a tendency of polls, when there was a black and a white candidate for office, the polls would tend to overestimate the black candidate's popularity. This is called the Bradley effect because Bradley was a black candidate for mayor in Los Angeles who lost even though the polls said that he was ahead. Why is this? This suspected reason, nobody proven it, is that people who are uncomfortable voting for a black person might not want to share that discomfort when someone asks them because it feels like a public setting, because they feel like they'll be thought of as a racist. People who may be uncomfortable with the black candidate are like, sure, yeah, I can vote for the black candidate. I think that's who I prefer. And then they get into the voting booth. It's just them, and they think about the consequences of their action. They're like, no, I can't really do that. Again, it's not generally people lying. It's a kind of self-deception. Happily, this effect seems to have disappeared, which, if that explanation is correct, suggests we have grown up a little. The other kind of bias in asking questions is leading questions. A leading question is any question that pushes the answer in a direction from what they, the person actually thinks. What qualifies as a leading question can be kind of complicated, but a straightforward example is something like this. If you kind of, if you offer them a fact, you tell people what other people think, if you use loaded language like pay way too much money to pay for a simple burrito, it's easy to push people to give whatever answer you want. Obviously this question, lots more people are going to say no than if you had just used the second sentence. Uh, much subtler things than this kind of beating over the head can uh, have an effect on the answer the order in which questions are asked, the exact wording, what the person saw just before you asked the question, all can affect their answers. And in situa some situations, it's an incredibly complex question, exactly what would be a correct answer. There are situations like the vast majority of people believe that we should reduce, the U.S. government should reduce its foreign aid spending. On the other hand, if you ask them what number to reduce it to, what, what do people think would be a good amount of foreign aid spending, it's about 10 times or 100 times more than the government actually spends. So it would be easy to ask a question that would get an answer anywhere from we should vastly reduce foreign aid to we should vastly increase it. And it's not at all clear which of those is actually what people think. So this is a deep and complicated question. All right. Here's an example. This is a group project from a few years ago. It will give you a sense of what kinds of things people do in group projects, what kind of issues come up in them, um, and it gives you a chance to try out all of the different concepts that we've worked on. Uh, the project was they were interested in how exercise affects sleep. So that's their initial question. How does exercise affect sleep? They turned it into a precise question by sampling adults shopping at Stop and Shop on Saturday morning, and public safety officers who are having coffee at Jasmine's. The two groups they sampled. Um, what did they ask them? They asked each subject how many hours per week they exercised, and they asked them how many hours per night they slept on average. Okay, so from that information, you should be able to answer all of the questions that I've marked below. I suggest that you pause this, take a moment, write down your answers, We'll go through them one by one. If I say something that isn't what you expected or isn't the same as what you wrote down, you might want to pause and rethink your later answers in light of that. It may help you understand them. Pause as many times as you need to. Uh, it is extremely valuable to try, even if you fail or do it completely wrong, to try 
doing the correct thing and then see the correct answer. It makes a huge difference. Okay, so first few questions are here. What is the population in this case? The population is all adults. You could also say all people. Very important what it isn't. The population isn't everyone stopping, shopping at Stop and Shop or all public safety officers or everyone at Jasmine's. You shouldn't let the sample tell you what the population is because samples often use a small sampling frame for convenience. The population is everything you want to draw conclusions about. If you're interested in whether exercise affects how much you sleep, you're interested in whether exercise affects everyone's sleep. So you could argue it's all people, or maybe it's just all adults. That's a little fuzzy, and it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal to know the population is everything you intend to draw conclusions about, you are interested in asking about. It is not determined by the sample. All right, what is the explanatory variable here, and is it numerical? Or categorical. The explanatory variable, the thing doing the affecting, is the number of hours per week you exercise. If you would ask each, that's a question you can ask of each individual, how many hours a week do you exercise, and the answer is of course a number, so it's numerical. Uh, we, if you are confused by this, you should always Think about what the population is first, and therefore what an individual is. And remember, once you know what an individual is, in this case, individuals are people. Not going to matter whether it's adults or Americans, or it's, if it's people, you ask yourself, what, are, what pieces of information are I gathering about each person? Then it's usually clear. Uh, if you are confused about the population, you will tend to mix up variables with parameters. In particular, if you answered the average number of hours per week adult sleep, that's not correct. That is not the variable. And if you, that may seem like a pedantic distinction. If you don't get comfortable making it, you will get lost in more complicated questions. With that in mind, what's the response variable? And is it numerical or categorical? It is how many hours per night you sleep. And again, that's straightforwardly numerical when you phrase it that way. All right, what is the sample in this case? I think that's not too bad. The sample is all the people who are shopping at Stop and Shop, who are asked at the shop, Stop and Shop on Saturday, and all the public safety officers at Jasmine's that they ask. I haven't described to you how they picked who to ask, because so that's a bit of an issue, but that's what the sample is. Is this an experiment or an observation, and why? It is not an experiment. It's an observational study. Why? Because an experiment requires randomly assigning values of the explanatory variable. What would that be in this case? It would be randomly assigning how much people exercise. It would be making half the people you talk to exercise for the next week and half the people you talk to not exercise. They obviously did not do that. That's why. Nothing to do with how much they affected people or anything like that. It's just the, the explanation is because they did not force people randomly to exercise or not. Is it a simple random sample? No. Not all adults are equally likely to be chosen. In fact, anyone who doesn't shop at Stop and Shop and isn't a public safety officer or doesn't go to Jasmine's is excluded. So it's not even a random sample. Um, OK, now a little bit subtler questions. What are lurking variables? Let me remind you, a lurking variable has to affect the explanatory and be related to the response variable. Affecting the explanatory, in this case, means it's got to affect how much you exercise. And then, for starters, let's just imagine it has to affect how much you sleep. And here's an important tip. Anytime you're looking for lurking variables and the explanatory variable is a behavior, which will be pretty frequent in this class, behavior like how much you exercise, the thing to ask yourself is, what kind of person does this? What kind of person exercises a lot? And then ask yourself, how might that kind of person differ in their sleep habits separately from the exercise? 
For some reason, people frequently mix up lurking variable and sampling bias and try and find something that's both and usually confuse themselves. So you should ignore the sampling method while you're looking at lurking variables. So what kinds of people exercise more or less and how might they sleep more or less? Here's some answers I came up with. You may come up with some other ones. Old people tend to exercise less and old people usually sleep less. That's pretty straightforward looking bias, lurking variable. Um, healthy people probably exercise more and sleep better. So you can probably think of lots of other things, but they should sound something like this. A kind of person who's more likely to exercise and is more likely to sleep well or poorly. Oops. What's an example of a sampling bias? Remember, a sampling bias is a you need to identify a group of individuals more likely to be chosen. That's easy to do here, but then you also have to identify a parameter and a direction in which that group would shift in that parameter. What are the parameters we're interested in? We're interested in how many hours per week they exercise and how many hours per night they sleep on average. And here's kind of a subtlety because ultimately we would like to be doing an experiment uh, it, uh, it's not so useful to look at sampling biases that affect the explanatory variable. So I will try to focus my examples on the response variable. That's not something I'll ever like to take off for or anything. Um, so here's some I came up with. I would say that safety office, public safety officers, because they have such a physical job, are probably more likely to exercise than the general population. Now that's affecting, that is affecting the explanatory variable, despite what I said. Um, stop and shop customers are probably more likely to be families. Families tend to have more regular habits, so maybe they sleep well. You could also argue, maybe if it's early morning on Saturday, you're getting people with small children, because small kids get up early on Saturday morning and get their parents up. Um, so maybe people at stop and shop on Saturday morning sleep less. So in that case, you'd be arguing the same group differs in opposite directions on the same parameter. That's okay. Uh, sometimes there's potential sampling bias in both directions, and only some kind of careful study would tell you which one dominates. But it is important to come up with potential sources of bias, be able to assess them. Finally, what are some examples of measurement bias? In this case, we're asking people, it's a survey, so the only choices are response bias and leading questions. We don't know what questions they ask, so we have no reason to think they ask leading questions. They seem like they would be pretty straightforward questions. Um, but it's pretty clear that there would be a response bias. Um, people, I think, are very likely to exaggerate their exercise um, because they want to sound like they actually, you know, exercising people think of as being moral. Um, I would guess that people would underestimate their sleep because you just sort of sound a little bit soft if you claim to get enough sleep. But one could argue the opposite. Okay, that's lecture four. Here's what you should be able to do right now. You should be able to identify the five steps of study design, and I didn't put it down here, but you should be able to write the definition of measurement bias. And once you've processed this lecture, you should be able to recognize measurement bias, including response bias and leading questions, and in a given situation, like we did in the example, come up with potential examples of measurement bias.